Volume Three, Chapter Three of Celestina. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Amy McCracken. Celestina by Charlotte Turner Smith. Volume Three, Chapter Three. Elphinstone had now been absent some days, and the wind, which was contrary and violent, prevented his return to the place of his abode. Mrs. Elphinstone became uneasy at the storms which detained him, and Celestina participated in her anxiety. At length the wind sunk, and towards the evening of the fifth day of his absence was fair to bring him from Harry's. Mrs. Elphinstone, who had been a good deal alarmed by the hurricanes of several preceding days, and had wearied her spirits by watching the weather, and keeping an anxious eye towards the impracticable sea, found herself indisposed and shivering. And telling Celestina that she believed she had caught cold, she went to early to bed, remarking as she bade her good night that Elphinstone would probably be at home in the morning. Celestina, left alone, went out as was her custom, even although the evening was already closed in, and standing on the edge of the rocks near the house, remarked the singular appearance of the moon, which was now rising. It was large, and of a dull red, surrounded by clouds of a deep purple, whose skirts seemed touched with flame. Large volumes of heavy vapor were gathering in the sky, and the heavy surges swelled towards the shore, and broke upon it with that sullen regularity that foretells a storm. From the north, arose distinctly the pointed rays of the aurora borealis fiery and portentous they seemed to flash like faint lightning a little while till the moon becoming clearer rendered them less visible not a sound was heard but the dull murmurs of the sea on one side and the rapid waterfalls on the other whose increased noise foretold with equal certainty an approaching tempest celestina who was in that disposition of mind to which horrors are congenial, walked slowly on notwithstanding, but quitting the cliffs on account of the gales of wind which now blew from the sea, she went along a narrow pass, where there was a cairn or heap of stones, loosely piled together, the work of the first wild natives of the country, and as that was as far as she thought it proper to venture from the house, though it was not more than eight o'clock, she leaned pensively against it, and watched with some surprise the fluctuations of the clouds that were wildly driven by the wind across the disk of the moon, and listened, with a kind of chill awe, to the loud yet hollow echo of the wind among the hills, which sometimes sobbed with stormy violence for a moment, and then suddenly sinking, was succeeded by a pause more terrible. It was in one of these moments of alarming silence that Celestina thought she saw the shadow of a human form for a moment on the ground as if the person was behind her who occasioned it. She was very little subject to fear, but the loneliness of the place, and her own desponding spirits together, made her start with terror and turn around. Something immediately glided away, and convinced that the first impression had not been the work of fancy, she hastened with quick steps from the place, and hardly at the distance of above a hundred yards, ventured to look behind her. She fancied that she saw a man standing in the place she had left, and the strange superstitions of the islands of which she had heard much since residing on them, crowding at that moment in her mind, she became extremely terrified, and hurried on with such unguarded speed, that a little before she reached the house, she trod on a loose stone that turned under her foot, and she fell with some violence and with considerable pain, which, together with the fear she had felt before, produced a momentary stupor, from which she was awakened by finding herself eagerly raised from the ground by some person, who wildly expressed his fears for her safety, and whose voice she recognized with astonishment that deprived her of utterance. Montague Thorold, surprised at that moment, conquered the pain she felt. "'Oh, Mr. Montague,' she cried, "'is it possible? For heaven's sake, what brought you hither?' "'No matter what,' replied he eagerly. "'Think not, ask not about me.' When you are yourself hurt, in pain, bruised, I fear by your fall. I have no hurt so great, said Celestina, rising and attempting to walk. I feel no bodily pain so acute 
as that which your extraordinary conduct gives me. Let me assist you into the house, interrupted he. Do you not see that the tempest which has been gathering the whole evening in the southwest is now driving hither with uncommon fury? And let it come, answered she languidly. I am just now so very unhappy myself. I feel so much for the unhappiness of my friends, particularly of your father, that it is indifferent to me what comes. It is not for me, at least, that you feel, answered he, that I know but too well. But undoubtedly you will be greatly concerned for poor Elphinstone, whose boat has been beating about ever since nightfall, within the mile of the shore, at the imminent hazard of being dashed to pieces. At this information Celestina forgot herself, forgot the uneasy astonishment into which the unexpected presence of Montague Thorold had thrown her, and the danger of Elphinstone occupied all her thoughts. "'Oh, where?' cried she. "'Where is he? Show me the bark which is in so much hazard, and for heaven's sake call the people, who are not, perhaps, aware of its danger.' "'Alas!' answered he. Several men had been upon the shore above half an hour, alarmed as I was, at the danger the vessel was in of striking on the rocks, which she has got among from the unexpected shifting of the wind. But in their present state no human assistance can do them any service. He had, during this dialogue, taken her arm, and led her towards a point of the rock where she saw, by the pale and uncertain light of a moon, wrapped continually in volumes of clouds, the boat struggling among the dark heavy waves, which often totally concealed it, and continually driven by the sudden gusts of violent wind from the point it was attempting to reach. She now saw and shuddered at the peril of those who were in it, but still fancying it was possible to afford them assistance, she felt impatient and almost angry that Montague Thorold, holding her arm, within his, stood gazing when she fancied he might be helping. "'Why stand here?' cried she when we might be of use in summoning people to the assistance of those poor creatures. While she yet spoke, and while Montague, though not less alive in their distress, was less sanguine in the hope to assist them, and therefore still hesitated, she disengaged herself hastily from his arm, and flew towards the house, no longer conscious of anything but their danger. Before she could reach it, though the distance was not a quarter of a mile, the wind suddenly blew with treble fury, and a hailstorm accompanied it, against which she found it difficult to stand. She found the door open, and Mrs. Elphinstone, whom the wind and the talking of the servants had awakened, already below. Trembling with apprehension, with the sudden appearance of Celestina increased, "'Good God, my dear friend, what is the matter?' cried she. "'And why are you out in so dreadful a night?' "'Ah, dear madam,' replied Celestina, "'Mrs. Elphinstone, his boat!' "'What of him?' interrupted her terrified friend. "'Is he drowned? Is he lost?' "'No, no, I hope, I believe not,' cried Celestina. "'But a boat which they say is his, is beating off the island, "'and the people are afraid it will go to pieces.' "'This was enough for the unhappy Mrs. Elphinstone, "'who, seeing in its most dreadful light the evil which threatened her, "'now ran herself wildly toward the beach, "'while Celestina, overtaking her with difficulty, persuaded her to accept her assistance, assistance which she was very little able to give. The sad event had happened before the trembling friends had reached the headland. The boat, striking on the sunken rocks, to save it from which the united efforts of the little crew had been exerted in vain, was staved to pieces, and the unhappy men, already exhausted with fatigue, were unable to resist by swimming the violence of the sea. Mrs. Elphinstone and Celestina looked out in vain for the place where a few moments before the boat had been seen. No vestige of it remained, and they saw only by the waning moon, which but served to lend new horrors to the view, the wild waves dashing over rocks in sheets of white foam, while the fury of the winds and the beating of the rain hardly allowed them to stand on the precipice that overlooked the scene of stormy desolation. Celestina doubted but little of the calamity, and therefore endeavoured to persuade her unfortunate friend to return to the house. But this was impossible. She continued to wander backwards and forwards for some moments, till terror quite overcame her, and she threw herself on the ground, saying in a low and solemn voice to Celestina, "'Elphinstone is drowned. I know he is. Here I will wait to see his corpse, which will be driven on the shore in the morning.' Then, starting up, 
she would have gone down to the shore from an idea which suddenly occurred to her that he might yet be saved by swimming. Celestina, not knowing whether it was best to prevent or to indulge her, unable to dissimulate and affect hope she did not feel, was in a situation hardly better than that of her distracted friend whom she supported, when Montague Thorold joined them. Mrs. Elphinstone, occupied only by the terror of the moment, took no notice of the extraordinary circumstance of a stranger, whom she had never seen before, thus suddenly appearing. But unconscious of everything, and heedless of who he was, requested in accents of piercing anguish his assistance to help her down the winding path which led to the beach. He lent it, though very certain that the catastrophe had already taken place, which by her eager and wild inquiries he saw she yet thought doubtful, and giving her one arm, while with the other he clasped the trembling hand of Celestina, they reached the place where seven or eight men were already assembled. The moon was by this time down, and the darkness was only broken by livid flashes of faint lightning, which, with the thunder muttering at a distance, increased the horrors of the storm. Amid the black and swelling waves, however, objects were seen floating— and many of these heavy seas had not yet broken on the shore, before these objects were discerned to be the bodies of those who had perished, and that of the ill-fated Elphinstone was one of the first which was thrown on the beach, and too well known by his unhappy wife. She now no longer remembered all the causes of uneasiness that her husband had given her, but saw only Elphinstone, once so fondly beloved, the possessor of her first affections, the father of her children, a disfigured corpse before her. Her native strength of understanding, and the calmness acquired by habitual suffering, forsook her at once, and grief produced a momentary frenzy, during which fearful paroxysm Celestina, whose presence of mind was now summoned to the assistance of her poor unhappy friend, had her conveyed with great difficulty to the house, where Montague Thorold attending them both with the most assiduous tenderness, she watched for many days over the disordered intellects of the ill-fated Mrs. Elphinstone, before she saw them restored. At length, the violence of her affliction, which Celestina found means to soften by presenting her children continually to her, and talking to her of those that were absent, sunk into the calm torpor of despair. She heard nothing, she saw nothing but the children, whom she would not suffer to be a moment absent from her and the agitation of her mind preying on her slender frame, she was reduced to a state of languor, which made Celestina tremble for her life. Celestina had, immediately after the fatal event, written to Cathcart, desiring his directions, and even entreating him to come himself to fetch them all from a place where there was now no reason for their stay. But she knew that it must be five or six weeks before she could have an answer, and hardly dared trust herself to meditate on the scenes of distress she must in time encounter. Amid all the horrors, however, which had surrounded her, she had not forgotten the fears and alarms to which she knew the absence of Montague Thorold exposed her father, her benefactor. She seized the first interval, after the death of Elphinstone, to urge him the cruelty of his conduct, and to entreat him to return home. But he replied that nothing on earth should induce him to leave the place where she was, while there was a probability of his being of use to her, and that whether she admitted him to see her, or drove her from him, the island should be a residence while she remained in it. All that then remained for her was to write to Mr. Thorold, which she did under cover to Cathcart, acquainting him as briefly as she could of the unexpected appearance of his son, and all that happened since. Having thus far acquitted herself, she found herself in a situation in which it was almost impossible for her to help receiving the assistance of one to whom she trembled to be obliged, while she knew it encouraged and augmented a passion that empoisoned his life. On him, however, she was compelled to entrust the regulation of the last melancholy offices that were to be performed for poor Elphinstone, who was interred in a little ruined chapel, about two miles from his late residence, his wife consenting reluctantly to his disposition, and taking opiates incessantly to procure that torpor which alone prevented the more violent ebullitions of grief from seizing her again, when the remains of her husband were removed. Recourse to opiates became gradually a habit with Mrs. Elphinstone, and though Celestina trembled for the consequences, she thought it almost inhuman to oppose the application of any remedy, 
which under such circumstances won her friend from sorrow even an hour. Yet the frequent absences it occasioned compelled her to be very long, and very often alone, with Montague Thorold, to whose manly tenderness on the late said occasion she could not be insensible, and to whose unceasing attention she was every hour more obliged. In the first conference they had held when the melancholy event to which they had been witnesses allowed them to talk of themselves, Celestina, after urging him to return to his father by every motive with which reason and truth supplied her, repeated to which he replied, that he knew all she represented before he came thither, that this only wish was to be allowed to see her, though at a distance, and his only gratification, that of being suffered to breathe the same air, that it was the natural privilege of every human being to pursue their happiness when it injured nobody, and that finding his consisted in being near her, though without even the hope of her admitting him into her presence, he had followed that axiom, and had for some weeks been the distant and unseen companion of all her walks. I was the Highlander, said he, who supplied the vacancy I had before taken care to make when you went on excursion on the water. I am the person of whom you have sometimes caught a glimpse at a distance, and who would never have approached you nearer, had not my fears for you the evening of the storm thrown me off guard, and induced me to conceal myself within a few yards of you, behind those piled-up stones against which you leaned. Ah, I heard you sigh. I heard the name of Willoughby repeated with tenderness. But I bore it all. And nothing, believe me, nothing but your fall, your apparent danger, could have compelled me to break the vow I had made never to intrude upon you never to offend you with my unhappy passion. Celestina could not help being affected with the melancholy solemnity with which he uttered these words, but making an effort to prevent his perceiving it, she said, It is absolutely necessary now that you again take up as much of so proper a resolution as relates to not speaking to me on a topic which to you must be useless, and to me painful. And while you persist in remaining here, let me at least owe it to your complacence not to be distressed by declarations to which I cannot, ought not, will not listen to. Montague Thorold, then laying his hand on his heart, assured her that if she would allow him only to see her, indulge him only with being useful to her in her present remote and comfortless residence, he never would again name to her the passion which he knew, he said, he must carry to the grave and from that moment he kept his word, though Celestina saw with more emotion, perhaps, than the warmest declarations could have given her, his painful struggles, and continual contention with himself. But while her pity for him increased, she studied more carefully to conceal from him that she felt any, and behaved with as much calm politeness as she could have done towards the most indifferent man in the world. To beguile the tedious moments during which they were compelled to wait the hoped-for arrival of Cathcart, and while the sea that surrounded them was agitated continually by the wintry tempest, Celestina had recourse to the books, with which poor Elphinstone, who, among all his faults and errors, was not without taste, had furnished a closet in the house. Mrs. Elphinstone, moved by the representations of Celestina, to attend to her health and for the sake of her children, whose sole dependence was now on her, consented by degrees, to listen while Celestina read— Montague Thorold, whose residence was at the cottage of a Highlander, that boasted of having two rooms and a chimney, about a mile farther on the island, was sometimes admitted to these parties. And as Celestina was soon fatigued, and as he read remarkably well, Mrs. Elphinstone appeared pleased with his taking occasionally the office of the reader, and gradually he became accustomed to attend them every afternoon, and to read aloud to them, till the hour of their simple supper." Among the books in this little collection there were several that Celestina recollected as the peculiar favorites of Willoughby, and the remembrance of those days when he read them to her, though never a moment absent from her thoughts, were now most forcibly recalled by hearing them again repeated. Some pieces of poetry particularly affected her, from their simple pathos, and the manner in which Montague Thorold read them, while they often drew tears from the unhappy Mrs. Elphinstone an effect at which Celestina rejoiced, as her grief was now settled into that still and sullen melancholy unsolicitous of consolation, and incapable of receiving it, which, while it produces a degree of apparent calmness,
preys with fatal power on the heart. Thus passed the heavy hours, till at length, after a fortnight longer delay than they had reckoned upon, letters were received from Cathcart. They contained intelligence that old Winnington was dead, and Jessie in such a state of health as made it most impossible for Cathcart to leave her. He therefore besought Celestina to accept the protection of Montague Thorold for herself, for Mrs. Elphinstone, and her children, and to hasten to his house, where he was now as able as happy to receive them, as soon as was possible and safe. Mr. Thorold wrote also to Celestina, and expressed his hope that the wild eccentricity of his son, which had occasioned to him so much pain, might at least be of some service to her, and entreated her to allow him to attend her and her unfortunate friend into Devonshire, where he assured her he would prevent her receiving any trouble from the importunities of Montague, which he would be weak enough to presume too much on her favour. He wrote also to his son, but after the contents of that letter Celestina did not inquire, and Montague carefully concealed them. It was now determined that the plan laid down by Cathcart and Mr. Thorold should be pursued. Montague undertook the arrangement of every thing, and within ten days they were ready to depart. The weather alone seemed now likely to prevent their crossing the water, Mrs. Elphinstone, who had till now feared nothing, being so apprehensive for her children that every gust of wind, every swell of the sea, made her shrink back with dismay, and postpone from day to day a voyage which she yet earnestly wished over. It was the end of November, and very good weather could hardly be expected. Dark and gloomy days, with storms of wind and rain, succeeded each other, and Celestina, whose thoughts had been of late called frequently from her own mournful contemplations to the acute distresses of others, now relapsed again into that desponding state of mind which her long absence from Willoughby and his apparent neglect of her unavoidably threw her into. She had confined herself a good deal to the house since Montague Thoreau had been so much with them, because there either Mrs. Elphinstone or the children were usually in the room, and she by that means avoided being alone with him. But now, as he was more engaged by the preparations for their departure, which he had undertaken to superintend, and in settling poor Elphinstone's accounts with his employers, Celestina again ventured out of an evening, whenever she could escape unseen. In one of these walks, along the edge of very steep rocks, where the scene presented only desolation, the dark and turbulent sea on one side, and on the other a succession of mountains, which seemed to have been thrown upon each other in some tremulous convulsion of nature. She turned towards the yet more dreary north, and reflected upon the condition of those whom the poet describes as the last of men, the inhabitants of Siberia, of Lapland, and those extreme regions where life at last goes out. Alas, cried she, if they have not our enjoyments, they suffer not from these sensibilities which embitter our days. Their short summer passes by laying up necessaries for their long winter, and with what their desolate region affords them they are content, because they know not that there are comforts and conveniences beyond what affords them. Void of the wish and the power to observe their other modes of life, they are content with their own, and though little superior in point of intellect, the animal from which they derive their support, yet they are happy, if not from the possession of good, at least from the absence of evil, from that sickness of the soul which we taste from deprivation and disappointment. A deep sigh closed the short soliloquy, and after indulging a little longer in this train of thought, it produced the following sonnet. The Laplander The shivering native who by Tanglio's side beholds with fond regret the parting light sink far away, beneath the darkening tide, and leave him to long months of dreary night, yet knows that springing from the eastern wave the sun's glad beam shall reillume his way, and from the snows secured within his cave he waits in patient hope, returning day. Not so the sufferer feels, who o'er the waste of joyless life is destined to deplore fond love forgotten, tender friendship past, which, once extinguished, can revive no more. O'er the blank void he looks with hopeless pain, for him those beams of heaven shall never shine again. A few days after this, 
an interval of calm weather gave to Mrs. Elphinstone courage to determine on embarking. But the evening before that on which it was finally fixed that they should go, she told Celestina, with a solemnity of voice and manner, that convinced her she was not to be diverted from her purpose, that she could not be satisfied to leave the island without visiting the spot where lay the remains of her husband. Celestina, without much hope of success, represented to her how wrong it was to yield, or rather to encourage sorrow, unavailing to its object, and injurious to those who were his living representatives, by depriving her of her calmness of mind when exertion was most necessary, and injuring her own health, now so particularly precious to them. To these arguments her poor friend replied, with melancholy composure, that she should suffer more in reflecting on her omission than she could do in fulfilling what she had persuaded herself was a duty. Celestina, therefore, agreed to accompany her that evening. Montague Thorold had already shown her the place, and Mrs. Elphinstone desired to have no other witnesses to her sorrows than the soft-hearted and pitying friend, without whose generous sympathy she would probably long before have sunk under them. It was near two months since the death of Elphinstone, when this melancholy farewell visit was to be paid by his widow. A calm but sullen day, with an overclouded sky, threatening snow, was succeeded by a dark but mild evening. The distant sun had left a few lines of red light in the western horizon, and the moon, within a day or two of being at the full, edged with fainter rays the opposite clouds, through which it appeared not but at intervals. The unhappy widow, leaning on the arm of her tender friend, walked slowly and with languid steps, as she was guided towards the ruined chapel, and a universal pause of nature seemed to respect her sorrows. Not a breath of air wandered among the channel of the hills, and the waterfalls murmured low and hollow at a distance. The sea was calm, and being low in the sands was hardly heard, while the birds, and few animals who inhabited the land, were retired to their repose. Around this little chapel, now more than half in ruins, a few rude stones were raised to the memory of the dead of former times. The grass and weeds concealed many, and on the rest no figures but those of crosses rudely cut were now visible. Elphinstone had been interred within the walls of the edifice itself. His widow desired her friend to enter it with her, to show her the place, and to leave her. As they approached the spot, the ground sounded hollow beneath their feet, and a mournful echo ran around the damp walls. The moon darting for a moment through the ruined stonework of the dismantled window, showed them a broken table that had once been the altar, on which some pieces of the Gothic ornaments of the chapel and several human bones were scattered, and near it the newly turned up earth, on which a few stones were loosely piled, discovered the grave of poor Elphinstone. Celestina could not trust her voice to point it out, but leading her friend to it, she immediately comprehended that there lay the remains of her husband, and fetching a deep sigh, she stopped at it. "'I had better not leave you, surely,' cried Celestina mournfully. "'I cannot bear to leave you in this dreadful place.' "'Pray, oblige me,' replied her friend. "'It is the last indulgence I will ask, and I promise not to stay long.' "'I will wait for you without, then,' replied Celestina. "'And pray, dear Sophie, consider your children.' and let it not be long that you indulge this sad propensity. She then went out of the chapel, and seating herself on one of the ruined monuments near its entrance, yielded to all the gloomy thoughts which the place, the hour, and the occasion inspired. Ah, who knows, cried she, whether I may not have reason to lament even as this poor mourner, whose groans tear my heart to pieces while I listen to them. I hear her, she implores forgiveness of the shade of her departed husband for all the involuntary offences she committed against him. She, whose whole life has been one course of suffering, solicits forgiveness of him to whom those sufferings were owing. She forgets his faults towards her, and recollects only that he once loved her, and that he was the husband of her youth, and that he is gone for ever, while she trembles for the future fate of him, whose errors she only remembers to recommend them to mercy." Dreadful, then, is the final separation even from those of whom, though we have reason to complain, we have once loved. Ah, what it must be when an eternal barrier is put between us and those whom we unreservedly and passionately love! 
Willoughby, if I have regretted so deeply our separation, what would become of me should I ever hang over the grave where thy adored form moulders in the dust? O oh God, grant that I never sustain a trial like that! Overwhelmed by these sad thoughts, and terrified at the increasing darkness and fearful silence, which was broken only by the deep sighs of her unhappy friend, prostrate on the grave of her husband, she started up to recall her from her mournful employment, when Montague Thorold, breathless with haste and anxiety, approached her. She was glad to recognize him, and took the hand he offered her, while he cried impatiently, "'Wherefore is all this, my dear madam, and where is your friend?' Celestina led him to the place, shuddering as she approached, while Mrs. Elphinstone, recovering herself by an effort of resolution, and having perhaps disburdened her oppressed heart, and satisfied her mournful propensity, agreed immediately to go with them. And having turned once more her streaming eyes on the spot as she quitted the chapel, she suffered each of her friends to take an arm, and lead her home in silence. Where Montague Thorold advised her and Celestina, to take immediately a few hours' rest, as the tide would serve very early in the morning for their embarkation in the vessel which now lay ready to receive them. They followed his advice, and before daybreak on the 20th of December, near seven months after their arrival on the Isle of Skye, they quitted it, and landing safely on the coast of Scotland, they proceeded with very great fatigue, though fortunately without being intercepted by such heavy snows as they had at such a season reason to apprehend, to Edinburgh, where it was necessary for them to rest some days before they proceeded on their long journey to the other extremity of Great Britain. End of Celestina, Volume 3, Chapter 3, Recording by Amy McCracken Volume 3, Chapter 4 of Celestina. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Amy McCracken. Celestina by Charlotte Turner Smith. Volume 3, Chapter 4. As Mrs. Elphinstone was too much dejected to allow her to go out, Celestina, who had great pleasure in visiting antiquities, and whose active mind was perpetually in search of new ideas, was compelled either to relinquish these gratifications, or to permit Montague Thorold only to accompany her. He was generally so guarded in his conversation, that, though it was easy to see how much he suffered in suppressing his passion, Celestina had no reasonable ground of complaint. He found, however, at Edinburgh, that it was particularly uneasy to her to visit the places she wished to see without some other companion, and recollecting that one of the professors was well known to his father, he made use of the claim that acquaintance gave him, and by that means Celestina received all the attention and hospitality for which the Scottish nation are so justly praised. The gentleman to whom she thus became known had several daughters, amiable and elegant young women, with them she saw all that the capital of Scotland afforded worthy of observation. With them she visited the ruinous chapel and magnificently mournful apartments of Holyrood House, and gave a sigh to the fate of the lovely, luckless Mary, who was almost his last resident sovereign. Then, parting with her newly acquired friends with mutual regret, she proceeded on her road to England, nothing particular occurring on the way for some time, except the slow but evident amendment of Mrs. Elphinstone's spirits, and the symptoms of increased attachment to Montague Thorold, who, if he loved her before with an attachment fatal to his peace and subversive of his prospects, now seemed to idolize her with an ardor bordering on frenzy. In despite of the resolution she had avowed to him, in despite of those he had himself formed, this ardent and invincible passion was visible in everything he said and did. He seemed to have forgotten that he had any other business in the world than to serve her, to listen to the enchantment of her voice, to watch every change of her countenance. His whole being was absorbed in that one sentiment, and though he had promised not to consider the advantages which his own wild Quixotism, aided by accident, had thus obtained for him, as making the least alteration in the decided preference of Celestina for another, he insensibly forgot, at least at times, 
her unalterable affection for Willoughby, and seeing, notwithstanding all her attempts to conceal it, that she pitied him, that she was not insensible of his attempts to please her, nor blind to his powers of pleasing, he cherished, in defiance of reason and conviction, from which he fled as much as possible, the extravagant hope that the barrier, whatever it was, between her and Willoughby, would be found invincible, and that the time, though it might yet be remote, would at length arrive when he should himself be allowed to aspire to her favour. The human mind, however strong, yields too easily to these illusions, whence at least it enjoys the soft consolations of hope, and sees rays of light which, though imaginary, perhaps are all we often have to carry us on, with courage, over the rugged way, too thickly sown with real or missing them with imaginary and self-created evils. It is therefore little to be wondered at, if Montague Thoreau, so sanguine in temperament, of so little experience in life, for he was yet hardly twenty-two, and so much in love, should thus eagerly feed himself with hopes of its ultimate success, and be wilfully deaf to every argument which reason would have brought against the reality of the gay visions he cherished. Celestina, pitying and esteeming him, was very anxious to reduce this unhappy and fruitless prepossession to the bounds of friendship and esteem, and though she at this time thought of Willoughby with so much internal anguish that she never on other occasions willingly named him, yet she now took occasion sometimes to speak of him, and purposely laid her train of conversation in such a way with Mrs. Elphinstone, as gave Montague Thoreau to understand that her sentiments in regard to him, who had first possessed, and still was master of her heart, could never suffer any material change, or be transferred to another, even though she was sure that she was personally divided from him for ever. After some days travelling, with the languor of Mrs. Elphinstone and her extreme anxiety about her children, rendered tedious, the party arrived at York, and there it was determined to remain two days. Celestina, who had nobody to receive her at the end of her pilgrimage, was peculiar delight, was not very eager to finish it. Mrs. Elphinstone, seeing nothing but poverty and dependence before her, of which her mind, being enfeebled by grief, was little able to bear a nearer prospect, was yet less anxious. And Montague Thoreau cared not how long a journey lasted which gave him what he must at its termination lose, the happiness of being with, and of being useful to the mistress of his heart. When they arrived at York, there was an appearance of snow. It fell with violence during the night, and by ten o'clock the next morning the north road was rendered impassable. The travellers were assured that in a day or two it would be sufficiently beat for them to proceed with safety, and as their original intention was to remain at least two days, the farther and material delay with which this circumstance threatened them gave to none of them any concern. The snow, however, continued to fall very heavily, and the cold became almost insupportably severe. The party were drawn round a good fire at the inn, and Mrs. Elphinstone had just put her children to bed, when an unusual clamour and bustle below attracted their attention. Horses were called for, and the loud voice was heard to say, "'If four are not sufficient, my master will have fourteen rather than be stopped a moment.' "'This is some matrimonial expedition,' cried Montague Thoreau, "'or why all this haste?' The idea, which the ladies allowed to be probable, excited some degree of curiosity, and when the waiters soon after came in to lay the cloth for supper, Montague could not forbear inquiring if the horses which were a short time before so eagerly called for were not for the accommodation of a young couple hastening into Scotland. The man replied that the gentleman was going into Scotland, and had been stopped by the snow about seven miles off, the horses he had to his chase being unable to draw him, but that he understood he was quite alone, that the horses and men had been sent to his assistance, and that he was expected there presently. The man, who probably loved to hear himself talk, went on to inform them, though they now no longer felt any great degree of curiosity, that the gentleman's valet de chambre and one of the postilions, who had come forward, who were warming themselves at the fire below, before they returned back as they were ordered, had declared that they were almost dead with cold. But as for that, sir, continued the waiter, he says that is sir the valet de chambre says, says he my master if once he's got a scheme in his head tis not cold no nor water nor fire neither as will find it an easy matter to stop him and then says he as for fatigue to his own self says he 
or danger or anything of the like nature or expense though it cost him a hundred ay or a thousand pounds why my master says he minds it no more than nothing tis all one to him yet to be sure says he he is a good master in the main and no sneaker neither in money nor liquor nor no other accommodation to servants and pray said montague thoreau who is this courageous bountiful and accommodating gentleman i did not think to ask his name sir replied the waiter but i can know in a minute he then without waiting for an answer ran downstairs and returning almost instantly said that the gentleman was squire of Avassour of, da of staffordshire Vavasour cried celestina in a faint voice and turning as pale as death good heaven to what purpose can Vavasour be travelling in such haste towards Scotland? Vavasour echoed Montague Thoreau, his countenance betraying all that passed in his heart. Vavasour! Ah, Mr. Mornay, it was to you he was undoubtedly going. Willoughby is returned, and he sends his friend to reclaim his betrothed wife. Sends his friend? Oh, no, no, answered Celestina with quickness. That cannot be. Were Willoughby returned, he would not send— rather it is some sad news he has to impart and i must prepare myself for it i must bear it be what it may the cruelest anxiety now took possession of both celestina and montague thoreau they both dreaded an explanation though unable to bear the suspense thoreau went down to see what he could gather from the men but mr bavasseur's servant was gone back to meet his master and the postilion had only come with him from the last post town celestina in the meantime now traversed the room now went to the window and now appeared to attend to the conjecture mrs elphinstone offered that perhaps this journey might in no respect relate to her but might be owing to one of those sudden starts of caprice in which vavasor was known to indulge himself this state of suspense and conjecture which is of all others least easy to be borne did not last long for in about a quarter of an hour the carriage in which vavasor himself was arrived celestina now debated within herself whether she ought to send to him to inform him of her being on her way to england or suffer him to proceed whether she doubted not he was going even to the hebrides in search of her this internal debate was however short her extreme solicitude to have news of willoughby superseded every other thought and whether the vavasor was going to scotland to announce her fate to her by the direction of willoughby or merely in consequence of some whim of his own she knew that he in all probability could give her some intelligence of him whom she most wished to hear montague thoreau who trembled least in consequence of this interview all the day-dreams in which he had been indulging himself should at once be destroyed would have represented to her some imaginary improprieties which his wish to find them raised in his mind celestina however had with all her candour and humility a decisive spirit the effect of her great good sense which when she had once examined and determined on any subject did not leave her open to the trifling perplexities of feeble and unimportant debate she considered that even if vavasor was going on some eccentric idea of his own to follow her into scotland it would be cruel and unjust to suffer him to pursue such a journey at such a season and therefore steadily resisting all the representations of montague thoreau against it she addressed to him the following note Miss de Bournay presents her compliments to Mr. Vavasour, and having learned by accident that he is at this place, requests the favour of seeing him to-morrow morning to breakfast with Mrs. Elphinstone and with her at half-past nine. Montague Thoreau, being unable wholly to prevent, thought he could at least impede the delivery of this note till the next day, but Celestina was too impatient to hear of Willoughby to be blind to the artifice which Montague was too much in love to manage very dexterously, and therefore quitting the room herself, she found one of the waiters, who she enjoined to give the note to the gentleman, who was just arrived, as soon as he had done supper. This was not perhaps very discreet, but Celestina thought much at the moment of Willoughby, and very little of Vavasor, and in her anxiety to hear news of the one, she reflected not on the way in which it might be conveyed by the other, who, after a long and cold journey, having finished his supper, was not likely at least to be a clear and calm messenger, and a moment's reflection would have convinced her that he was not a man who, from motives of delicate forbearance and polite deference, would put off the interview to the time she had named. No sooner was the note from Celestina delivered to Vavasor 
Then he ran upstairs with an impatience amounting almost to frenzy, his eyes flashing fire and his countenance expressive of the violent emotions with which he was agitated. He hardly noticed Mrs. Elphinstone, but casting a look of angry surprise at Montague Thoreau, whom he immediately knew, he approached Celestina, took her hand, and eagerly kissing it, told her in a hurried manner that he was hastening to Scotland to give her intelligence of very great consequence, and to deliver her a packet from Willoughby. "'From Willoughby,' replied Celestina, so extremely affected by his abrupt entrance that she was ready to faint. "'Is he well? Is he returned to England?' no replied he without seeming sensible of the nature of her sufferings not return to england or likely to return but is he married then said celestina interrupting him in a still more trembling voice not yet but i have letter for you which give it me cried she hardly able to breathe he had it not about him but ringing for his servant gave him the key of his portmanteau and bidding him bring a large sealed packet which he said he would find there the man immediately returned with it, and Celestina, without speaking to Vavasor, hurried away with it in a breathless agitation. Mrs. Elphinstone, alarmed at her looks, following her in silence. All this time Montague Thoreau had remained leaning against one of the piers, with contracted brows and clasped hands watching the countenance of Celestina, while his own changed from pale to red, from red again to pale. He had always returned the dislike which Vavasor had shown towards him as much as his nature could return dislike, and this was increased by the abrupt and unfeeling manner in which Vavasor had executed a commission that, whether it brought to her welcome or unwelcome tidings, demanded, he thought, more delicacy and more preparation. When Celestina and Mrs. Elphinstone were gone, he felt no inclination, therefore, to stay with Vavasor, who walked up and down the room as if expecting their return but was preparing to leave it, when, as he crossed to the door, Vavasor, turning short towards him, asked how he came to be at York with Miss de Mornay. "'How I came, sir,' replied Montague Thoreau, with equal abruptness. "'Have you any right, sir, to inquire?' "'Yes,' replied Vavasor, contemptuously. "'I have a right.' "'To inquire into my actions, sir,' interrupted Thoreau. "'Surely not.' "'To inquire into those of Miss de Mornay, sir, I have a right.' Well, sir, if she allows of that right, to her you may then apply. But you will be so good as to leave me at liberty to be at York, or wherever else it is convenient to me to be. Not with her, sir, you must not. Not with Mr. Mornay, be assured. As for the rest, pray understand, that were it not for the circumstance of your being seen in company with her, I should never recollect that such a person was in the world as Mr. Montague Thoreau. Thoreau, though naturally of a gentle disposition, was little disposed to bear the contemptuous arrogance of any man. He therefore answered with more quickness that it was an honour he could well dispense with to be thought of at all by such a man as Mr. Vavasor. The tone in which he spoke this, and the emphasis he laid on the word such a man, provoked the haughty and impetuous spirit of Vavasor, and words rose so high between them that Mrs. Elphinstone, who was only in the next room, came in, and, extremely terrified at their violence, besought them to separate. Vavasor, whose passions were at all times too strong to suffer him to listen, either to reason from others or to his own, gave very little attention to her remonstrances. But Montague Thoreau, on seeing her extreme uneasiness, and on hearing the name of Celestina, became in a moment apparently calm, and assuring Mrs. Elphinstone that she had no reason to be alarmed, he addressed himself coolly to Vavasor, and said that if he had any business with him, he would be at his service in the morning. He then besought Mrs. Elphinstone to return to Celestina, and, taking her hand, led her out of the room, assuring her in a whisper that he would not return that evening to Vavasor, nor have any farther contention with him. "'Make yourself easy, therefore, my dear madam,' said he, "'and tell me, how is our lovely friend?' What are the contents of a letter which required so extraordinary a messenger? Mrs. Elphinstone answered that Celestina had appeared in great emotion while she read the beginning of the letter, and then telling her that she should finish it in her own room, had left her, in increased agitation, she thought, but without tears. "'And shall you see her no more to-night?' inquired Montague Thoreau. "'I rather believe not,' replied Mrs. Elphinstone. "'And do you think,' said Thoreau, 
do you think my dear madam that the agitation the emotion you remarked was the effect of joy of grief of grief of disappointment of regret i think answered she i believe celestina is now convinced that every probability of her becoming the wife of mr willoughby is at an end for ever then cried montague thoreau unable to repress the violence of his feelings oh then there will be hope for me there was something like the transports of frenzy in the manner in which he uttered this and mrs elphinstone was shocked at it be not too sanguine mr montague said she i do not believe that the affections of miss de mornay are to be easily or lightly transferred but if they were think of the powerful claims upon them that are using against yours claims what claims cried he who shall dare to dispute with me in heart to which nay nay answered mrs elphinstone this is all frenzy and wildness do you not know that you have no claim though i am willing to allow all your merit and do you not see that willoughby in being compelled to resign her recommends his friend vavasor to her favour and therefore sends him hither vavasor cried he recommend vavasor to her and with celestina who with all that dignified gentleness had a great deal of spirit with the proper consciousness of her own value would she bear to be consigned like a bale of merchandise to a friend and to such a man as vavasor impossible he dare not think of it but i wish he may for her insulted pride will mitigate the pain of her disappointed love and she will be mine the charmer will be mine the look the manner in which this was uttered increased the concern of mrs elphinstone who from her own recent and severe sufferings had learned to dread anything like romantic eccentricity she laid her soft cold hand on the burning hands of montague thoreau as they were wildly clasped together my dear sir said she in the gentlest accents i owe you a thousand obligations for all the attention you showed me in my late calamitous situation and ill very ill should i repay those obligations if i did not try as a friend to mitigate these violent transports believe me the heart of celestina fixed in her early life to one subject is attached to that object with more than common firmness vavasor's frantic fondness and your real merit will in my opinion be equally indifferent to her and i verily believe that if willoughby marries another as i conclude he will mr mornay will never marry at all montague thoreau could not bear this the idea of rivalry had been painful but the pain was mitigated by his knowledge of her character and the character of vavasor which with all its avowed libertinism he knew celestina could not even tolerate and certainly not approve but the idea of her living only for willoughby even when willoughby lived for another was insupportable and since he was unwilling to own it was possible he would therefore have been ready to quarrel with any body but mrs elphinstone for supposing it probable but to every being who was unfortunate and especially if that unfortunate being was a woman the kind heart of montague thoreau overflowed with good will and sympathy he therefore checked himself and saying he could be impatient to hear of miss de mornay in the morning he wished mrs elphinstone a good night and left her End of Volume 3, Chapter 4. Recording by Amy McCracken. Volume 3, Chapter 5 of Celestina. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. Celestina by Charlotte Turner Smith Volume 3, Chapter 5 It was not till after two or three readings, with a palpating heart, a heart so much agitated as hardly to leave her the use of her reason, that celestina perfectly understood the meaning of willoughby's letter which ran thus the only apology dear celestina that the unhappy willoughby has to offer for his conduct is 
to relate to you all that has befallen him since that fatal night when he parted from you at alvanstone the emotions which i must feel while i write i will endeavor to suppress both your sake and my own it shall be if i can command myself a history of events rather than of the sufferings to which those events have condemned me you know that after the abrupt and uncountable note that i received i hastened to the inn at exeter where i was informed some persons who had business of the utmost importance which omitted not of a moment's delay waited to see me the terms in which the note was written were such as gave me a strange alarm though i knew not what to dread this uneasy astonishment was not lessened when after much appearance of mystery i was introduced to lady castlenorth you know the woman and can imagine how ill her harshness when irritated by the malignity of disappointed pride was calculated to soften the blow which it was her pleasure to give me herself she told me that having heard i was on the following morning to become your husband she felt it to be her duty to save me from the horrors of such a union by informing me that she knew you to be the daughter of my mother the daughter of that mr everard who was my tutor and that the woman she had with her whom had been a servant in the house at the time could give the most indisputable account of your birth stunned as by a stroke of thunder i turned towards the woman of whose face as a servant of my mother's i had not the least recollection i know not what i said to her i only remember that she gave in a confused and vulgar way an account of what she pretended to have been witness to i suffered her to talk on for my very soul was sinking with anguish my mother's honor destroyed my celestina torn from me my soul recoiled from the idea as from an execrable falsehood yet when i remembered the solemn injunction that beloved mother gave me in her last moments to marry miss fitzhaman the promise she drew from me never otherwise to unite myself when my agonized mind ran back to the displeasure she sometimes expressed at my fondness and admiration for you i dared not with all the pain and all the horror i felt i dared not throw from me with the indignation this odious intelligence i dared not load the hateful communicators of it with the odium which would have been dictated by my swelling heart had it not been checked by these sad recollections which pressed upon me in despite of myself and gave me something like internal evidence of the facts i would very fain have denied there was in the countenance of lady castlenorth something of insolent triumph which i could not bear she made a merit of her disinterested conduct and talked of virtue and honor and integrity till i was blind and deaf she then threw out some reflections on my mother's memory which roused me from the torpor of amazement and sorrow to resentment she uttered some malignant sarcasms against you and i flew from her she had however completely executed her purpose if it was that of rendering me the most wretched of human beings and in quitting the house which she did soon afterwards 
had the barbarous pleasure of knowing that she had destroyed my peace for some time if not for ever to return to you celestina under the doubts which distracted me was impossible to become your husband so lately the fondest the first wish of a heart that doted upon you was not to be thought of while well, ideas of so much horror obtruded themselves on my mind yet to leave you without accounting for my absence to leave you to all the torturing suspense of vague conjectures to leave you to suppose i had deceived and forsaken you was cruel and was unpardonable it was however what after a long and dreadful struggle i determined to do i might indeed have put an end to your conjectures by delivering you over to others more tormenting by communicating the doubts lady castlenorth has raised but this i found i could less bear to do than even to leave you wholly in suspense believing her capable of anything which revenge or malice could dictate there was reason notwithstanding all my trembling apprehensions to suppose it more than possible that she might have invented the story and have bribed the woman with her to give evidence of its truth to this possibility my mind clung with the eagerness of a drowning wretch and i could not resolve to sully before you the memory of my angel mother which i know you hold in such tender veneration i could not determine to raise in your delicate and sensible mind doubts and terrors which might make such fatal impressions as might impede our union even if the fallacy of this invention to divide us was detected in a state of mind then which i will not attempt to describe i at length determined to send for cathcart and without explaining even to him the motives of my sudden journey to secure if i could your continuance at alvanstone and to set out myself to discover the real circumstances of your birth and never to return till i had the most thorough conviction that you were not the daughter of my mother or till i could learn to consider you if it were so only as a beloved sister ah celestina i little knew the task i undertook yet with anguish and depression to which no words can do justice i set about it my first step was to find out watson my mother's old servant who had never i knew left her for many years i knew that after her death and on receiving the legacy of fifty pounds that her mistress left her she had retired to the house of her son who was married and settled at whitehaven i might have written to have inquired after her but then i must have waited some days in suspense i could not bear and while i was in motion i felt my misery less from an idea that i was doing something to end it i sat out therefore on horseback for white heaven and on my arrival there learned that she had been dead about six weeks this first hope of certainty thus frustrated it occurred to me that perhaps among her papers there might be some memorandums that would be useful and as she always hired and discharged the inferior servants and kept an account of the time and terms of their service in a book i flattered myself that i might find some date of the time when hannah biscoe who pretended to have been in her confidence 
and to have been entrusted with a secret of such importance really lived in the family i told her son that to see all the papers his mother had left was of importance to me he readily brought all he had there were some books of accounts and some memorandums about servants but none that gave me any light or were of any importance to my inquiry for none went back above ten years the man told me there were more but that not knowing there were of any consequence or even supposing them likely to be called for he had given them to his children who had cut them to pieces i believe however sir said he that there are some letters in a drawer of a bureau which i remember to have seen during my mother's illness i will fetch them if you think they will be of any service i desired him to do so and he brought me about twenty letters some of them were from my mother while she was in london in the years seventeen seventy nine and seventeen eighty and watson was at alvanstone with you and my sister of whom she had as you well remember the care of all occasions where it was necessary for my mother to be absent you were then about nine and matilda about eleven years old the only sentences of any kind of consequence were these i have no notion of any real danger from the landing of troops from the fleets of france and spain no landing can take place and tis all nonsense and bravado i thought you had more sense watson than to catch the panic of the vulgar and the ignorant which they rather like to communicate however since you write so pressingly to know what should be done if anything should happen i give you an answer first that nothing will happen and secondly if you have any alarm which a reasonable being would consider such take my two girls and bring them up hither instantly but i shall be down at alvastone in about ten days and nothing can happen within that time believe me my two girls was the only sentence in this letter on which i could lay any stress my two girls well and what then have i not heard my mother a thousand times say my two girls my matilda my celestina were names indiscriminately used my children even my daughters were terms not infrequent with her ah little little did her generous and benevolent heart suppose that such advantage might be taken of that generosity of that benevolence for now even now no i do not i cannot i will not believe that celestina has any other claim to her friendship to her protection than what arose from the generosity and benevolence now do i say can i say it oh heaven how dreadfully contradictory are the sentiments that agitated and tear my heart let me however recall my scattered thoughts and remember that it is a simple history of facts only and not of feelings that i promise to relate another letter was written to watson where mr everard after a very tedious illness which had long confined him in town went down to alvanstone in the year eighty for change of air rather than to his own parsonage where some repairs were then going on the letter was expressive of great solicitude and anxiety but from thence what could be inferred nothing 
but that the dear and benevolent writer was solicitous for the health of a friend to whom she had long been attached there was not in this a word on which the most invidious observer could dwell nor was there in any other letter a syllable to give me any confirmation of what i dreaded to find still i procured from the person who had succeeded to watson's effects every paper and every book that remained but i found nothing and returned to london as miserable as dissatisfied as i left it nothing made me more wretched than the questions with which i was now persecuted i fled from society stopped at a small village in the neighbourhood of london where i avoided everybody who was likely to know me and thought only how i might satisfy my own torturing doubts and escape those of others the most obvious method seemed to be to find out the woman who had accompanied lady castlenorth and question her when she was no longer under the influence of her employer but this i could not do without getting at my uncle's house information which i knew not how to set about to go there was hateful to me i could not now bear the sight of people whom i had never loved and to whom i imputed all the misery i labored under my servant farnham had been little used to these sort of negotiations and knew not better than i did how to integrate himself into the favor of the persons through whose means only he could procure the intelligence so necessary to us he went however about it as well as he could but all i learned was that lady castlenorth had soon after her journey into devonshire sent the woman who accompanied her into her native country which was either norfolk or suffolk and with so much secrecy that nobody knew whither she was gone or how she was provided for but farnham with some difficulty drew from the rest of the servants with whom he found means of conversing that she had boasted in some moments of vulgar exultation that her fortune was made for ever no clue however could i obtain by which no clue however could i obtain by which i could find out this woman and after much fruitless inquiry where the art of the adversary with whom i had to engage baffled all my acidity i determined to go to lord castlenorth to state to him the stigma that his wife had thrown on the honour of my mother his sister and to demand that i might have proofs of the facts she alleged such as she could give such as she could now give or that she might acknowledge the wickedness and injustice of her aspersions i was not aware till i conversed with lord castlenorth to how debilitated a state of indolence ignorance pride and prejudice can reduce the human mind his however was of so singular a cast that instead of being shocked at the injury done to his sister's honor he afflicted to resent in spite of family pride my doubts of his wife's veracity flew from the point to which i attempted to bring him and we parted in mutual disgust at least i was disgusted and more wretched and more hopeless than before i had made this attempt every effort to discover the retreat of the woman failing 
my next measure was to go to the convent at Hears. It was owing to these cruel circumstances, Celestina, that I left you in doubt while I remained in England. It was owing to these that I left England in the hope, though it became every day more mingled with apprehension, that I left England without accounting to you for my conduct. Were these surmises groundless? Why should I impoison your delicate mind? Why should I sully for a moment the sacred fame of my mother by divulging them? Were they found to be at length too well substantiated? It would be then time enough to inform you of them. On my arrival at Hears, I went directly to the present confessor of the community, out of whose care my mother took you. I found him to be intelligent, obliging, and officious. From him I learned that the present superior was a young woman of a good family, who had been compelled to take the veil, and who would probably have very few real scruples as to giving me all the information she could. I succeeded easily in my research, as far as it depended on these two persons. I found that the memorandum of my mother's having taken you out of the convent, by the name of Celestina de Moray, remained, and I found, with emotions on which I must not dwell, that there was another memorandum of expenses for the little English child received at the request of Madame de P. Such is the literal sense of the French words. Who then was this Madame P.? An old nun who had lived in the house above five and twenty years and who was the only person who recollected any circumstances of your reception, told me that she well remembered that this Madame de P. came from Bayonne, or some part of the country in the neighborhood of that town, and that she was an intimate friend of the then abbess, and her name, of which only the initials were expressed, in the memorandum was la marquise de pelletier i inquired of the old nun if she knew on what ground it was you were represented as an english child she replied that she knew no more than that when first you were received under the care of the superior you were said to be the child of english parents or at least that one of your parents was of the nation, but that soon afterwards this was, by the abyss's authority, contradicted. It was forbidden to be mentioned in the community, and it was ordered that you should from that time be spoken of as Mademoiselle de Moray, while intimidations were given that you were a relation of your own, born of a concealed marriage, and that your father being dead and your mother married to another person, you were to be considered as belonging only to the community in which you were destined to pass your life. Ah, Celestina, what food was here for those corrosive conjectures which preyed on my heart having exhausted however every kind of information which was here possible to procure i set out for bayonne where some of the family at least of madame de pelletier were i understand to be found she had herself been dead some years i met however with her son a gay young man of four or five and twenty from whom i could obtain nothing 
but a general confession that his mother probably had from the general tenor of her life occasion in more than one instance to exercise the secrecy and kind of offices of her friends and very probably obliged them in her turn and when i explained to him my reasons for the anxious inquiries i made which i thought the only means likely to interest him for me he said that he was raymond a despoir at the little embarrass into which i had fallen that la belle demoiselle might be my sister or might be his that he had not the least hope of being of service to me in unraveling the mystery for he had destroyed all his mother's papers in pursuance of her dying directions some years before and did not believe the slightest trace remained of any connection with an english lady or an english family i inquired where his mother lived in the years seventeen seventy and seventeen seventy one which was about the time of your birth and where in the year seventeen seventy two the time of your reception in the convent he replied that she was then sometimes at paris where she was believed to have an arrangement with count w a german nobleman sometimes at pezanas and sometimes at heries from all this i could gather nothing to my purpose and monsieur de Pelletier, soon quitting his house in the neighborhood of bayonne to go to paris i returned thither also infinitely more unhappy than before my research all i have related celestina is so little convincing when it is put together that perhaps i ought not to lay any stress upon it when to such slight and unsatisfactory ground of conjecture is opposed the character and the principles of my mother yet shall i tell you truly that the energy with which she pressed me with her last words to marry miss fitzhaman the displeasure she always shrewd at my expressing any partiality towards you her grief at the death of mr everard which it was easy to see she never recovered some words which though i could not clearly understand them escaped her lips almost with her last sigh and which the name celestina seemed united with some ardent prayer or some earnest injunction while in her cold convulsed hand she pressed mine to her trembling lips o oh, celestina those sounds i have since interpreted into a confession of this fatal secret still still inarticulate as they were they vibrate on my heart and now united with the story of lady castlenorth and the circumstances i have gathered of your being born of english parents all all unite to render me wretched yet there is not the least likeness between you and my mother there is not the remotest resemblance between you and mr everand who had remarkably strong features and very red hair o oh, celestina what am i to conjecture what am i to do can i ought i on such grounds to resign you can i ever learn to consider you only as my sister where shall i go to next how satisfy my doubts how ever possess again a moment's happiness every other evil is light to this even the disorder of my affairs 
the necessity i shall soon be in to sell elvastone is hardly felt on my leaving england i raised money at an enormous premium in order to pay vassiver which i could not bear to owe him uncertain as i was what would become of me this together with my absence has alarmed some of my mortgagees who talk of reclosing their mortgages while my own neglect of my affairs has in despite of cathcart's acidity contributed to my embarrassments but what are these inferior distresses compared to the wretchedness of a heart adoring celestina yet afraid of indulging his passion lest it lead him into guilt ah every evil fortune could inflict but this i could bear but again it is necessary to recall my pen from the description of feelings to the narrative of facts lord and lady castlenorth and their daughter arrived in the early part of the summer in france i was then absent on the research i have related to you but heard they have been very earnest in their inquiries after me at paris and on my return thither some months afterward i received a letter from lord castlenorth earnestly desiring me to join them at florence or naples the letter imported that the alliance he once wished was no longer in question but that finding his health every day declining he wished to see the only male relation he had on the settlement of some family concerns this invitation i ought not perhaps on the other accounts to have refused but the hope of being able to gain some farther intelligence on the circumstances which occupied my mind incessantly determined me at once to accept it i went then and met them at florence where my uncle received me with as much overacted civility as when we parted last he had treated me with supercilious scorn i found him however not more reasonable than before the prejudices that had taken possession of his mind were so strong that he was angry and amazed that what made the whole business of his life could be to any other person matters of mere indifference he talked to me incessantly of remedies for the gout of the medicines he was taking and of their effects told me how he slept and how he eat and read dissertations without end on chronic disorders in general and from this discourse he glided by some link which escaped me into his other favorite science heraldry oh the quarterings and bearings which i was compelled to affect hearing the genealogies i was distracted with and the marriages and intermarriages to which i appeared to listen while in fact i knew nothing of what he said and only endured this sort of martyrdom in the hope of seeing lady castlenorth who on my first visits did not deign to appear all these later harangues were i found intended to impress on my mind the pride and prudence which would attend a union with my cousin his daughter and the advantage it would give me above any other alliance i could form my patient acquiescence was imputed to returning inclination for this boasted connection and when i thought to be sufficiently impressed with the ideas thus meant to be conveyed to me and to be weaned from the weakness i had betrayed i was admitted without any solicitation however on my part 
to the honour of seeing Lady Castlenorth and her daughter. The elder lady was the only one of them with whom I wished to have any conversation, and her love of hearing herself talk obtained me this favour, in spite of all the displeasure she had conceived against me, but it was very difficult to bring her to converse on that subject which alone interested me. She would talk politics, or give me a dissertation on the nature of the soul, or on the eruptions of Vesuvius, decant on the age of the world, or on her own age, if her auditors would allow her to be not quite five and forty but of Celestina she would not talk, and if ever I, in spite of her evasions, introduced the conversation, she affected to hear me with horror, and to consider every mention I made of a person whom she called so connected with me as the most indelicate and improper conversation with which I could entertain her she was for the most part surrounded when i was admitted to her with abati and the oracle of a circle she had herself formed in which it was generally impractical to entertain her with any other conversations than that she chose to lead to her daughter who had formerly received me with so much happiness and who had since been offended in the tenderest point, a point too in which her extreme vanity had rendered her particularly susceptible, affected no longer the overweening pride which in our first interviews had been so repulsive, but a soft melancholy which sits well enough on some people, but was in her more likely to move mirth than pity she seldom spoke to me but when she did it was with the air of one of whose just indignation was conquered by softer sentiments i knew i never could deserve those sentiments from her and therefore was very sorry to see them even though certain they were feigned but it was here only I could hope to gain any information of the woman, Hannah Bisco, who pretended to have lived with my mother nearly twenty years since. Lady Castlenorth evaded with wonderful art, ever giving me any trace of the circumstances, and of her daughter I knew it was in vain to inquire. But there was a little smart Italian girl called Justina, who had attended on Miss Fitzhaman for some time, and who had been in England with her, and I took occasion, as often as I could see her, to say some oblinging thing to her, and sometimes to make her a trifling present. Justina, in consequence of my taking so much notice of her, began officiously to put herself in my way, and I believe her vanity prompted her for some time to suppose I had very different motives for my attention than those with which I was really acutated. But in a foreign woman of that rank, even vanity usually yields to advice. When I had obtained an opportunity of clearly explaining myself, Justina undertook to procure me a direction to the woman whom I was so solicitous to find. She produced it in about a week, but artfully evaded my question as to how she came by it. I sent off my own servant instantly with it determined to follow him myself if the information as to her place of abode proves to be true 
i received an account from him that a few days before his arrival at the house in suffolk where she was said to live she had removed from thence and the people either did not know or would not tell whither she was gone this seemed so like an artifice of lady castlenorse to prevent my making the inquiry which she knew i had so long and so earnestly desired that i could now no longer doubt but that justina had betrayed me but during this disquieting suspense time wore away and you celestina what did you what could you think of me i entertained the strongest hopes and since lady castlenor so industriously kept me from the person she had herself produced as likely to give me authentic and indisputable testimony that she knew her evidence would not bear investigation and to this hope i eagerly adhered my mind however was too much irritated by the idea of such complicated treachery to allow me to keep terms with her as i had hitherto done i was wandering about italy all the time of farnham's absence on his rejoining me i went back to the residence of lord castlenorth and very peremptorily taxed his wife with fraud i denied that hannah biscoe lived with my mother at the period she pretended to have done so and that least i should discover the deception that she had been sent away from the place where i had had with difficulty discovered her lady castlenorth affected the calm indifference of injured innocence the proud consciousness of ill-treated integrity she affected to declare that she was desirous of my seeing this hannah biscoe that she knew not of her departure from the place whither she went which was the house of a brother-in-law nor was in any way concerned about her but added she rising and going to a cabinet where she kept papers you shall presently be convinced that she did live with your mother in the year seventeen seventy she took out a letter which i saw immediately to be my mother's hand it was directed to hannah biscoe at mrs willoughby's south audley street where my mother's town house then was these were the words hannah i desire you will immediately on receipt of this go to kensington and deliver the enclosed to the person for whom it is directed and let me know by the return of the post whether the orders i gave in a former letter were executed and how everything goes on there alvastone april twenty sixth seventeen seventy m willoughby i returned the letter to lady castlenorth and expressed myself very warmly insisting upon it that from such evidence nothing could be derived or even guessed at but she bade me with a contemptuous smile remember that when i questioned this woman at exeter she had told me that you were for the first months of your life nursed at kensington whither she went almost every day to see you and that at five or six months old you were sent abroad and when my mother went to the south of france on pretence of recovering her health eighteen or twenty months after the death of my father you were conveyed thither and there put under the care of a friend who placed you soon after with the superior of the convent of st celestine at Hears, as a relation of her own the coincidence of the story with what i had heard before relative to madame peltier 
struck me with more force than anything i had yet learned i left the house of lord castlenorth more miserable than i had ever been before and again set out for provence hardly knowing why and not caring at all what became of me ever since that period celestina i have been wandering from place to place in search of information which i cannot obtain and which obtained would certainly render me wretched if indeed any wretchedness can be greater than that which in my present state of miserable uncertainty is my lot to suffer are we then celestina are we related by blood and is there an invincible bar between us was my mother that admirable that excellent and almost faultless woman capable of living in a state of continual dissimulation as to you and of hiding one fault by another which might have been followed by consequences so hideous to my imagination o oh, celestina it seems sacrilege to her memory to think it yet her aversion to my expressions of tenderness towards you her conduct in a hundred instances i can recollect her strong injunctions the promise she exhorted from me to marry miss fitzhaman a promise urged with such vehemence even in her last moments could the poor consideration of pecuniary advantage influence her then did it ever influence her and the repetition of your name with her last breath mingled with words that might be a prayer for you but which i have since thought was possibly the fatal secret which she determined to divulge only in death the sad recollection of that scene her countenance which i continually behold her voice which murmurs still in my ears all all contribute to empoison every moment of my life and to make that tender affliction that ardent love which was once the joy of my existence and the pride of my heart the severest curse with which heaven can pursue me yes celestina unless i dared indulge that fondness with which my heart overflows i would i could forget you for ever and determine never to see you more for i despair of ever seeing you as i pardon me i am lost in the confusion of sensations i cannot describe and at this moment i hope so miserable a being does not exist on this earth write to me celestina you have more strength of mind than i have you are not like me the sport of agonizing passions write to me tell me what you would have me do farther to unveil this sad mystery or to throw it from us for ever if that may be i have told vassiver what it appeared impossible longer to conceal from him he is warmly my friend and you may employ him in any way in which you think he can be useful celestina i commit you to his protection till till when heaven only knows and i dare not trust my pen with another word only i entreat you to write me and may every happiness that virtue and innocence and excellence like yours deserves ever be the portion of my celestina whatever becomes of the unhappy g willoughby thus ended this long letter and thus was explained the strange circumstances that had caused celestina so many tears but she wept not now she read the letter over twice her first tremendous emotion subsided but her stunned senses had not recovered their tone it was late it was cold her candle had burnt nearly out she put the letter on her pillow and unable to undress herself threw herself on the bed in her clothes 
and lay pondering on what she had read on willoughby's situation and her own till the tedious night was at an end End of Volume 3, Chapter 5 Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C.